You and Joan, your house is astonishing and I've tried to describe it to people, right? And that was a very violent reaction to what I said. Richard, what, what, what is that? Uh, no, there are mosquitoes because it's 32 degrees here today. So, oh, is it? Um, they are, they are, I don't want to shut the doors, but they're here. Um, Stop. <laughs> it's like doing an impromptu Mick Jagger. Yeah, all right. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, all right. What's up, YouTube, as they say. Hello. So today's guest, quite an extraordinary individual. He's a lover of life. He really sucks the marrow out of life. Is that a phrase? We have dined at each other's houses. It's Richard E. Grant. Well, you need to look more to your left. That's your right. There. There. Yeah, but bring your eyes with your face. Yes, that's me. Yeah. That's me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for doing this, first of all. Thank you for asking me. Not at all. Good Lord. I mean, as, as guests go, sir, you, you are. You are at the top of any list, surely. Smoke up the fundament. What? No, it's, 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 it's very true. Now, we should let the viewer know you're not in Britain. Why is that? Because I feel that shirt is more fitting where you are in the okay. beautiful... I mean, in, in the south of France. In the south of France. This is wonderful. Indeed. Well, you're about to be, aren't you? Well, yes, but I, I obviously try to play a far more humble persona. So, whereas Richard E. Grant, I think, can swan off to the south of France very convincingly. Yeah, and just annoy people. I, I read in this, I think it was a Vanity Fair, one of those back page, the Proust questionnaire at the end, where Meryl Streep was interviewed and she said that no matter who you are or what you've done, you are always going to hack somebody off. And she said she has actors that she knows are talented and she knows everybody admires them, but she can't stand them. So when you say, oh, there he is swanning about in, that's exactly what I think is exactly the fire that you, it's the fuel you're giving to somebody to go, well, I already hated that bastard anyway. And this is even more reason to hate them. But I think that's a thing of, of our times, isn't it? Because I, I got the impression when I was growing up in the 70s that if an actor had done well, they'd flaunt yeah. their success and you'd see them driving the Rolls Royce or something and, and it would be more celebrated. But I do think now there's the slight feeling of, oh, I, I, I better not say. You can't, you can't say at all. Yeah. But you, but you on your on your Instagram, I noticed you'd yeah. been to the Bracant. That's a public Instagram, isn't it? Yeah. Because I know you're a lover of the Bracant. It's a French word for flea market. Yeah. So it means just just mean addicted to buying junk, which my wife and I, as you know from having visited our house, is full of. I've tried to describe your house in London to to people, and it's very hard. It's quite unlike any other house I've ever been to. It's full of sort of papier-mâché heads in there. You've got dolls in there. Big, giant-sized carnival papier-mâché heads that uh, the pair of us have been collecting at junk markets and antique fairs for you know the last 40 years. Any, anything to do with puppets or heads or masks, all that stuff. Whereas our host, Rob Bryden, can you believe the success that you've had so far already in your life? No, because because I because the route I took to it involved being a local radio yeah. presenter. So basically, yeah. for me, any kind of success is, is amplified because you'd never have thought I'd get to that from where I started. That is what I think is one of the great levelers of our profession is that there is this sort of democracy that goes through it. It's non-ageist, apart from the you know how you're cast, but. You have to get on with everybody of all ages, and everybody has had the experience of starting off from scratch, where you know nobody knows you from matter. Yeah, but I do. Don't you think, though, that uh, don't somebody... point at me? <laughs> I'll point at I, I'm only kidding you on that because uh, because I point a lot, and Joan always says to me, "Don't point at me. It feels very aggressive. It's like it's like a gun. Don't point at me." So as you pointed at me, I thought I'm going to call you on that. Well, well, listen to this. Um, yes. Eddie Marsan, Eddie Marsan's yes. brilliant actor. Indeed, he is, uh, and very funny man as well. His wife 
was, Janine, was a makeup artist. And I think it was she who said that an actor's yeah. emotional development ceases the minute they become famous. I certainly agree with Ali Marsan's uh, wife's wisdom on this because I've always thought that the age somebody becomes famous is the age that they're emotionally yeah. arrested at. Yeah. So that for a middle-aged man like Leonardo DiCaprio, who I don't know and I'm sure you do. Um, <laughs> Why would I know Leonardo DiCaprio? And 21-year-olds, as is Sir Mick Jagger, because they became famous at that age, so maybe in their heads. I do think I do think I'm very appreciative. I do think that I am. You though, you take it to a whole other level. You seem to, you seem to love life. Now your experience at the Oscars. I do. Your experience at the Oscars, I thought, was fantastic because you you made no attempt to play it cool. Uh, I've never been cool. So even the idea of trying to play something cool is so beyond... Was it as enjoyable an experience? It seemed to me as if you were trying to be almost mindful the whole time and to, to, and to live in the moment all the way through it. Yeah. I went to a film festival in Telluride, which is up a mountain in Colorado, in a ski resort. I had made the movie a year and a half before with Melissa McCarthy, and we went to a screening on a Saturday morning, uh, 11 o'clock in the morning, neither of us having seen it, neither of us having seen each other in the interim, and we'd worked together for six or seven weeks. Because it was the first audience that saw it, we had no idea whether people would laugh or whatever. And you could feel the temperature in this room literally transform from people laughed a lot, and then you could hear people cry. Wow. And then at the end, there was this silence, and then they all stood and cheered. Melissa said to me, I've never experienced this before, and she got an Oscar nomination for Bridesmaids, so she'd, she'd been through all that before. And she said, something's happening here that she couldn't have anticipated. And from then onwards, I kept meeting journalists um, in the couple of days that I was in Telluride who said, um, oh, we're gonna, we, you're going to be on this thing for the next six months. And I said, what do you mean? They said, well, February 24th. And I said, what is that? And they said, that's the Oscars. And my head sort of did a Linda Blair exorcist 360-degree swivel. I thought, they're speaking about somebody else in something else. Because it was very clear within certainly five weeks before the actual Oscars happened that Mahershala Ali was going to win because he was winning absolutely everything. So that, in a sense, took all the pressure off for the other four nominees. And we kept seeing each other at these, these various events. And we'd joke and say, have you got your... Um, acceptance speech ready, we'd all mind, we'd go, yeah, sure, I'd just like to thank my Hushala Ali, because we knew it, so, that was, I was just happy as a pig in shite to be there. At what point in the day do you, do you remember, oh yeah, I'm Academy Award nominee, Richard E. Grant? Well, um, when I have a mood dip, which is not that very often, uh, my daughter, who worked with your daughter, she will send me a text to say, um, Academy Award nominee. And it's just, she knows the effect it's going to have because, you know, there's be an emoji of somebody crying with laughter. And that's exactly what it feels like. It's sort of a sudden reminder of like, oh, yes, one, you know, brief, shiny moment, you know, in February 19, 2019, yeah. um, this happened. There are lots of awards, and, and, and if one is lucky, one, one can be nominated or win. But the Academy Awards... And now, where do you keep all your awards? Because I'm not seeing them on the shelf behind you. Have you hidden them? No, I've got them there, so that, so that they w so oh, I they can have. look at them for reassurance during the interview. I can see, I can see Northwest Touring Comedian of the Year, which is one I, I picked Literally. up a while ago. Oh, I can see Number One Dad, which one of my kids put on a tile, and that means more to me, Richard, than some of the other awards. But you're not going to undiplomatically say which ones they are. <laughs> and obviously, the other big thing for you with the Oscars, and we share a love of this woman, although I think yours goes deeper and stronger, Barbara yes. Streisand. <sighs> you're, I didn't know that you were a fan. You know that I've got a two-foot sculpture of a head in my garden. Of course, yes, yes. Where do you get that? I've never seen them at Ikea. No, they're not in Ikea at the moment, but um, they should be. I met her on numerous occasions in that year. And then I, the, the experience that you will appreciate if you're a fan of anybody. I was doing a uh, series called Dispatches from Elsewhere in Philadelphia last summer. 
with Sally Field and Jason Siegel. My brain. Jason Siegel, thank, thank you, you very, very much. Because of Jason Gould, her son, my brain went to Jason Gould, as opposed to Jason Siegel, I love and adore. And I got this invitation to go to the Hamptons to uh, Donna Karen was having a screening of a Julianne Moore film. And they said, can you come on a Friday night? And it happened to be that that was the one day that I was scheduled to do a night shooting, you know what they're like, um, gruesome affairs. And yeah. at one o'clock on that day, I was having lunch in Philadelphia with Sally. She said, answer your phone. And I said, no, I won't because it's too rude. You know, I'd be mortified if I did that. She said, no, no, answer your phone because it may be from the production office. So I reluctantly did. And it said, night shoot delayed. You're not working till Monday. And I literally I threw a hundred dollar bill down at Sally and I said, I'll, I'll call you from the train, I have to run. I literally threw the money down and I ran out of this bistro, 10 blocks to the train station, got on the train. Long story short, I got a lift in Ron Perlman, the billionaire's helicopter at five o'clock and driven straight from the thing in East Hampton to Donna Karen's house, at which there were very, very many famous people, none of whom sort of even registered on my radar. Um, Donna Karen took my hand and she said, Barbara's in my guest house next door. Um, as soon as she appears with Jim, her husband, I'm going to come get you. So I was, I was speaking to Julianne Moore and Carmen Klein and so various people so doing this, sort of trying to concentrate, <laughs> constantly thinking, <laughs> where's the band? So she came out and, and then I saw her and I spoke to her and um, she said, are you stalking me? Because I, she'd given me tickets to go and see her at Hyde Park in um, in London, two weeks before that. She said, what are you doing here? And I said, oh, I'm here in Philadelphia. I told her a brief story of what I just told you. She said, you are stalking me. I said, yes, I am. Um, and I told her that I had commissioned this sculpture and she said, you're insane. I said, no, I know that. She said, no, 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 you are insane. So I said, well, so be it. Uh, wow. Are you going to write another volume of memoirs like With Nails, which was a fantastic book? Oh, thank you. Um, well, I write every day. You know, I keep a diary. But so the answer is the answer is yes. You don't want to annoy people. Oh well, I'd 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 love it. I've always known that, Uncle Bryn. Thank you. Ah, oh, that's <laughs> Richard. Whenever if oh. we ever email, he always begins it. Hello, Uncle Bryn. How can I not? That Christmas special. We literally watched it. I think we watched it on repeat that night that it came out. You know, along with the entire nation, we are very very grateful <laughs> to you. So. Um, well, it's just one of the great joys of, that you brought us. It's very, very kind of you to say, Richard, and I'll tell you for no, why. No kind. I've always I'll been an enormous fan, not just me, but Nessa, everyone down in Barry is a fan, and we all found you particularly frightening in Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker. Now, that <laughs> must have been, I mean, I thought Sex and the City was a hoot, but that must have been an absolute hoot for you to do. It was hilarious, Uncle Bryn. Yeah, what, what, was, what was so extraordinary about it is that uh, I got sent an interrogation scene from clearly a B-feature 1940s war movie of about 12 pages interrogating somebody and catching them out, um, which I self-taped, sent off. I didn't know what it was for. And then two months later, my agent called and said, You're being, they're sending a car for you to go and meet the director. Um, producer at Pinewood Studios. And I said, well, I have no idea what this is for. And they said, no, you did a screen test. And I said, no, I didn't for Star Wars. And I said, I didn't. So she had to then resend it to me so that I could know what I was talking about. And then I, when I got there, Nina Gold, the casting director was, was waiting at the door and she looked very excited. And she said, oh, you're about to go and meet the man himself. So I walked in there and Daisy Ridley was sitting with him. And I thought, oh, this is one of those situations where I'm being asked to, which had happened before, about 20 years ago, read in for some other actor who was, who was, who was up for, for the part um, huh. of something. So J.J. Abrahams was incredibly friendly, and within about two minutes he said to me, so you're going to do the part. And that, at that point it felt like the room <laughs> literally went upside down, and I don't really remember much of what he talked about for the next hour and a half. He told me what the plot was. He told me what my character was. I didn't remember any of that at all. And the experience, the experience of doing it, how, mu how many physical sets were there, or was it mostly green screen? They were, they, you walked onto that 
onto the deck. Really? That, um, all the corridors, all those doors are yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, everything was real. Stormtroopers, there was nothing CGI. Um, so for a Star Wars fanatic, you know, I'd seen the first one when I was a 20 year old drama student in 1977. Yeah. And if you had told me that, you know, 40 umpteen years later, I would actually be in the final one. Yeah, I, yeah. I just couldn't believe it. And I a great, great part it. as and well. I was convinced I was going to be cut out or fired. Oh, yes, so yes. I never told, never told my wife or daughter the name of my character for fear that somehow it would get out. What would, what's the ideal job for you? Because you, you, you're, you're about life, aren't you, more than just the work. <laughs> so what's the ideal perfect job? Well, you go first. What's yours? I would love to work, and let's put it out there, with Wes Anderson. Yes, me too. That would be that would be an absolute dream come true. And and I um, I was doing my stand up show up in Inverness, and Tilda Swinton came to see it, and she came back yeah. afterwards, and I said, "Oh, I loved you in whichever one it was." I, I oh, um, uh, Grand Budapest Hotel, which is a masterpiece. Yeah. I said, She's I fantastic. love that. And she said, she said, oh, she said, Wes would love you. You should work with him. I, I said, well, yeah, sure. OK. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Fine She's by me. She's putting a word, Tilda. Yeah. Yeah. And has she? Uh, not as yet. Well, Uncle Bryn, when you are on the set of the next Wes Anderson film, can you please remember <laughs> your old neighbor, yes. the receding hairline <laughs> from Richmond, who is an equally big Wes Anderson fan? Yeah, that would be that would be the dream. Yeah. Although, is yeah. it is it much more isolating when you are doing the Rob Brydon show? Yes. When you're just when you're on your own. Yeah. When you well. Except I, you get more money. Yes, you get a lot more money. So I was normally I tour on my own, so I take all the money just before lockdown because I wanted to do music stuff. I toured with a band, and I think it was an eight-piece band. So and they all expected to be paid. I mean, I I had no idea. So the amount of money, it, it comes back to a thing Steve Martin used to say in his Vegas show where he said, oh, OK, well, you know, I was I was wondering what to charge for the tickets. I thought maybe three nights at three hundred dollars a ticket. And he worked it all out. And then he comes to the conclusion. I thought one night, six thousand dollars a ticket. That's it. Goodbye. <laughs> and and while that is absurd, it has its roots in reality. Just before lockdown started, I had something in my diary yes. that I was looking forward to so much. I was going to see Steve Martin and Martin Short oh. at the Royal Albert yeah. Hall. And with yes. about two days to go or maybe one day, of course, it was cancelled. They went home. Imagine my anger when I heard that just one night before, the two of them had been having dinner at my dear friend Richard E. Grant's house. Now, what can I say? I, I, I'm immediately feeling a pang of deep mercury down the spine shame that you were not included and invited. So next time, I promise you on my life. Well, they're coming time, back. They're coming back next year. I so I guarantee that you will be at the table with them All because right. they were elects, as you can imagine. And I've known both of them for over 30 years. So, wow. so who from Gavin and Stacey have you, have you stayed really bonded well, with? Well, Ruth Jones, I've known, I was at school with Ruth. So she's one of my oldest friends. I'm still in touch with James. I'm still in touch with Alison. I hope I'm not forgetting yeah. anyone now. No, th those are the ones. It's mostly, well, Ruth, she's like a sister to me. James is, yeah. is a friend. We, we, we phone and la, la, la. That was a funny thing. We went on holiday to California last autumn and finished up down in Los Angeles and went to see his show just to be in the audience to yeah. watch it. And driving into Los Angeles, thinking how he's conquered that town. Unbelievable. Because you Unbelievable. drive in all these billboards for things you've heard of, things that you haven't heard of, I never will hear of. You're so yeah. aware of the competition in that town. God, yeah. It's fierce. And my thought yeah, was, fierce. thank God I'm not trying to compete in this town. Thank God I'm just visiting. And then there's James's face, yeah. massive at the side of CBS. I mean, massive. 
you know, I'm just full of admiration. He, he, is, he is such a huge star in America. It's It was very impressive. Yeah. You have French people and French places. I imagine you may want to go and scold some staff for allowing a mosquito. And I, and, I, and I know that you can be very harsh with them. Um, but as you said, a zero hour contract is a good contract. Listen, thank you so much. I remain your, your fan and your friend. Uh, have a great Likewise. time. And let's hook up when you're oh, back. Thank you. Thank you, Uncle Bryn.